Hey everyone, my name is Tim Mishak and I lead the debugger platform team at Microsoft. If you found this video, you might be familiar with WinDebug or KD, which are two of the tools we work on. In this video, I'm going to give a bit of an overview about how WinDebug works under the hood. This video isn't specifically about debugging techniques, but I am going to debug the debugger to give you an idea of how all this works together. This video will probably be most useful for anyone who wants to write debugger extensions or other tools that do something related to debugging but it may also be interesting to other people who just want to use Winnebug. So to start out, let's start up Winnebug with the target process. So here we have Winnebug, or the old version at least. And here we have the new one, which comes in the App Store. And here we have the console debugger, which comes with the SDK. Now, besides looking a bit different, they're all essentially the same debugger, and you can see that because the output here is the same. So what's the relationship between these? Well, they all share a central component called dbgeng.dll, which we usually just call debugeng. Each version of the debugger is just a shell on top of that core. We sometimes call each of these shells a client. So you have the Windowbug preview client, the original Windowbug client, and the NPSD client. All of these just surface the functionality of the debugger in different ways. Now, I think it's probably easiest to take a look at NTSD because that's one of the simplest clients. And I think the best way to go and dig into something like this is just to start debugging it. So let's do that. NTSD links directly to debugeng and loads it at startup. Let's take a look at what NTSD imports from debugeng. We can click through the contents here to get to the import table, and we can see what functions are imported from debugeng. Now, it might seem strange that there's only two functions imported from debugeng, considering all the functionality that it has. To understand that, we're going to have to take a look at the documentation page for debug create. If you're familiar with COM, this is going to look kind of familiar. You pass in an interface ID and you get out a pointer to a COM object, specifically the interface that you requested. For debug create, you're generally going to pass in the interface ID for idebug client. Taking a look at the methods that are in idebug client, and you can see there's kind of an overwhelming amount, especially considering the fact that you can actually query for many of the other interfaces that you see here in the documentation on that same COM object. Luckily, you only need to understand a few to get a basic debugging session running. We can take a look at what functions NTSD uses to figure out the important ones. So let's set a breakpoint on debug create and see what happens. I'm using the public symbols for debugeng downloaded from the public Microsoft symbol server. So this is something you can follow along with if you want. Resuming execution, and you can see that we hit debug create right away. The stack trace shows that NTSD is still parsing the command line. Let's do a GU to pop up one level on the stack after debug create returns. Looking at the disassembly with UB for unassemble backwards, we can see that the two parameters being passed in are a pointer to the GUID being queried for and a pointer to the G debug client object, which will be used to store the pointer to the idebug client interface. If we dub the, dump the memory there, we see a pointer to what looks like valid memory. And if we use that with DQS, the dump symbols at that location, we see that there's a number of pointers to what look like virtual function tables. If we dump the symbols at those addresses, we see a number of pointers to functions inside the debugeng module. Dumping another debug client v table, we can see that they seem to all be pointers to different interfaces all implemented on the same object. So now NTSD has a debug client object. We could take a look at all the different functions that can be called on this object, but for now, we'll just focus on the core functions that are needed to control a debugging session. There are really only a few that are critical to understanding how this all works. The first set that we will need to take a look at are related to how callbacks are set up. One in particular that we'll always need to set up is the output callbacks. These callbacks are set up with a method called setOutputCallbacks. So let's find that function and set a breakpoint. 
OK, so we found two versions. One of them seems to predate Unicode. We can just add a breakpoint on both of them, although I'm pretty sure this version of NTSD is using the wide version. We can use the same search pattern as before, but this time we'll use BM to set a breakpoint on all the simple matches. Resuming execution, and we get a hit right away. OK, so let's execute until the end of this function by using a GU for go up. And check out the disassembly of the code that just called into this function. Now, since this is a callback object, it's one that's expected to be implemented by whatever program is calling into DebugEng. In this case, it's NTSD. And we can see that we've got a reference to a global variable here that's being passed in as a parameter. And it seems to be probably a pointer to a callback object that's been created by NTSD. Just to be sure, let's check that out. Looks like a valid pointer to memory. And let's dump the symbols at that address. So we can see this looks like another table of function pointers for a com style object. Most of these look like the types of things you'd expect in some sort of callback object. But it seems a little strange that there's a bunch of different classes that seem to be contributing to this virtual function table. You see def output callbacks, def input callbacks, debug base event callbacks wide. So let's take a look at what methods are expected for the output callbacks. First, let's go to the documentation page for set output callbacks wide. Luckily, there's only one function that being finds for that, and that's the actual function we're looking for. And it's expecting a reference to p debug output callbacks wide. Let's go ahead and find what that is. Uh, I debug output callbacks wide. And looking at the methods that we've got here, we only have one method although it is expected that it's implementing the iunknown inf interface as well, which has three methods, which is add ref, query interface, and release. So the output callbacks should have four methods, at least. So the layout expected here for the virtual function table is going to be the three methods of iunknown coming first, and then the one method for our idebug output callbacks wide. So if you look at the headers or the documentation for iunknown, you'll see that the order is going to be query interface, add ref, and release. Now, we see the query interface up at the top there, and we do see an add ref, although it seems to be on a completely different object. But that third method seems to be unrelated to release. Let's take a short detour for a second just to make sure we understand what's going on. If we disassemble that add ref function, We'll see that the disassembly is actually quite short. While I'd expect that an add ref function would be short, since it should just be incrementing some member variable, it doesn't even seem to be doing that. So it looks like this function is just returning one to the caller and not actually doing anything with the ref count. I'd guess it's because this object is never actually expected to go away as long as NTSD is running. But the fact that the function is so short means the compiler has gotten a bit smart here and combined a few functions from different classes into a single version in the final binary. Let's just guess that the other function name is called NTSD bang def output callbacks add ref. So we can see that for both of these symbols, they evaluate to the same address. While that's a perfectly valid optimization, in this case, it can be a little confusing since it looks like we're looking at the wrong function. So if you ever see a call stack and optimized code that doesn't quite make sense, just stop and ask yourself if it's possible that it actually has a different name as well. This is particularly likely if the function is very short when it's compiled. Coming back to the output callbacks, the one function that we're interested in here is not the I and known members, but the output function here. This will get called every time some output happens from the engine. 
whether it's coming from the output while stepping through a function or output that's generated from an extension. Let's set a breakpoint on that callback function. It'll get hit a little bit later and we can see how that works. Before that can happen though, NTSD will need to start the debugging session. In this case, we launched NTSD with a command line telling it to start another process under the debugger. So it's likely we're going to see another call into the debug client object to create a process. Let's see if we can find that function on the debug client object. Okay, quite a few methods relating to creating a process. We can just set breakpoints on all of them with VM. Let's resume execution and see what hits. Okay, right away you can see that we get a hit on create process and attach wide. And let's run a GU to let this function finish executing. It looks like create process and attach to wide is doing the real work here. So let's do a few more GU commands until we get back to the NTSD module. It looks like before we even get there, we hit our output callback. Let's take a look at the call stack. So you can see that we still haven't left the create process call. And it seems like already the output callbacks are being invoked. If you look at the docs for idebug output callbacks wide, you can see that the text that's being output is the second parameter being passed. Since this is an x64 call into an object, that means the argument is being passed as R8. So let's see what the text is that's being printed out. This looks like the initial text that always gets printed out at the beginning of a session. So even in these early setup functions, You'll see output coming through these callbacks, which is one reason why anything using debug engine tends to set those up pretty early. You can get output callbacks at pretty much any time that a call is being made into the debug engine. In this case, it's a call to initialize a debugging session, but you'll also see calls when executing an extension command or when the target is running. This is probably a good point to have a little sidebar on what a debug client object actually represents. You might assume that each call to debug create will return a completely independent object, but that's not actually how things work. In reality, whenever you talk to a debug engine module, it has shared state regardless of which client object you're talking to. For example, if one client object is debugging a process, then every client object is debugging that process with the same set of extensions, the same breakpoints, and pretty much all the same state for everything else. That said, there is some state that is specific to each client, and importantly, that state includes the callbacks. So you could have multiple IDebug client objects created, all with their own output callbacks. IDebug client objects do have thread affinity, which means that in general, you can only call methods on an object from the thread that it was created from. And for output callbacks registered with that client object, it means that each client will also get callbacks on the correct thread. So now that we've seen our output callback get used, let's clear out the breakpoints that we had set so we can get back to the calling function NTSD. We'll use a G command to go back to the return address from the create process and attach wide function and you can see that here we are out back at NTSD. Even though NTSD just finished calling create process and attach wide, the target process isn't running yet. The target is created in a suspended state and hasn't yet reached the initial breakpoint. It won't start running until NTSD calls back into the engine telling it to run the main debugger event loop. To do that it uses the wait for event method. So let's set a breakpoint on that now. The wait for event method is a member of the IDebug control interface, which can be retrieved from the IDebug client object through the query interface method. Even though it's on a different interface, it's implemented by the same underlying object. So we can just set a breakpoint on debug client wait for event. Let's run a GU command to let the function complete. 
At this point, we have a real process that's being debugged, and the target process is run to the initial process breakpoint. Let's resume execution of NTSD. If we switch over to the window for the NTSD process we're debugging, you'll see it's just waiting on a command prompt. Everything is idle, and the debug engine isn't inside that main wait for event loop because the target isn't running. NTST is waiting for the user to type a command. What it does with that command is to call a function on the iDebug control interface called execute. Let's find that now. So you can see we have a few here, but the one that I know that NTSD is going to call is execute wide. So let's set a breakpoint on that. OK, resuming execution of NTSD again. And let's type a command over in our NTSD process. So you can see it broke in with the call to execute wide. Now, if we look at the documentation for execute wide, you'll see that the command string is the second parameter. So that's going to be R8 again. OK, so that's exactly what we typed. Let's resume execution and try a T command in our NTSC process. We break in again at execute wide, and let's let the function complete with the GU. This T command changed the execution state of the debugger. It hasn't actually executed in the target process yet, because in general, the only time that the target is running is when debug engine is running the wait for event loop. So let's resume execution again. When I say that NTSC has changed the execution status, this corresponds to a specific set of states that you can query through iDebug control. Let's take a look at the docs for that now. There are a number of different execution states, which can be manipulated directly via the APIs, or which can be changed from debugger commands. When debug eng is in an execution state that requires the target to run, calling wait for event will allow the execution state to affect the target being debugged. So NTSD sees that the execution state has changed to debug status step into, and calls wait for event to allow that to complete. When wait for event completes, the step into execution state is finished and NTSD is going to go back to waiting for user input. Let's clear our breakpoints and resume execution once more. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is how debugger extensions work. If you've used WinDebug, you've probably used a debugger extension command. They all start with an exclamation point, so we often just call them bang commands. Each extension command corresponds to an export of a DLL loaded by the debugger. One that you might have used before is bang LMI, which I think is an abbreviation for loaded module information. But how can we figure out which extension DLL implements that command? We can use .ext match to figure that out. So it turns out that it's implemented in debug help. So let's go back to with the bug and set a breakpoint on that function. OK, so let's resume execution again and go back to NTSD and run bang LMI on NTDLL. So we hit the breakpoint on debug help bang LMI. From here, the debugger extension can do whatever it wants with the debugger APIs, including reading and writing memory, querying symbolic information, and even executing other debugger commands. There's a lot more we could explore with how debugger extensions work, but that's easily enough content for another video. So I think that's a good place to stop here. In this video, we've covered most of the concepts you need to understand the high-level architecture of the engine. If you find this interesting and want me to go deeper into how the debugger works, let me know in the comments or on Twitter. Thanks for watching, and if you have other ideas or videos that you want me to cover on anything around WinDebug or WinDebug internals, let me know. Thanks for watching.